So definitions are always difficult to get to. And what I will tell you in the end is I'm going to give you a consensus definition. One person out of the group there, which included the Europeans with their definition and everybody else with their definition, one person withdrew, not a European in America. Everybody else agreed to the definition. So when you go to the debate tomorrow, I think, and they tell you there are other definitions, those people who are telling you actually agreed to this definition. So they may want to change their mind, but then they cannot agree to the other definitions. So you have to stick with what you go for. Okay. So, Sarcopenia. Here is classical pre-Sarcopenia. This is the world champion, 90-year-old, long jump, 5 foot, 8, inch, uh, eight inches. I didn't put that in meters, sorry. But so much less than the women high school. She has, or does she not have sarcopenia? Clearly, she's lost us a bunch. No question about it. So, the concept of sarcopenia actually started with McDonald Critchley, a neurologist in England, who first described age related wasting of the hands and feet. He pointed out that muscle wasting starts at the periphery as you get older and moves upwards, suggesting a role for nerves as well as muscles. Herbert Rosenberg was the first to use the term sarcopenia at a meeting, and Bill Evans then wrote up from the meeting and was the first to publish this. So the term was used originally for older people who had muscle wasting. Uh, there's your example again. Yeah, you see your examples. This is just showing sarcopenia age-related loss of muscle mass, which is called poverty of red, as Herbert Rosenberg described it. And if you look here, these are the world records for the clean and jerk. And somewhere around about 30 you peak. And after that, we go downhill. That is age-related loss of muscle mass and power. They tend to go together. Power goes down more quickly. We'll talk about that. So we really have a cascade that goes from sarcopenia, which is your loss of muscle mass, which is not due to obvious causes such as cachexia or peripheral vascular disease, going through loss of force and strength. Uh, Kratopedia is my favorite for the god Kratos because the Greek word thinomopedia just doesn't make it for not basically suggesting that you're strong or not strong. And then you go to dinopedia, which is a term I personally like but nobody else at the meeting likes, so just realize that it, it didn't make it. So that's called consensus. God, okay. Too frailty. You'll hear from Tammy about frailty later. What I will tell you in our middle-aged population, that we've now got nine-year follow-up, frailty trumps this rest of the stuff so far, that really this is ir irrelevant when you come to frailty. Frailty is a far better marker of what is going to happen to a person than when you look at sarcopenia or any of the other components. And then disability, which is really where you're trying to go. We're trying to stop the loss of ADLs in these people. And this is just from Benini's excellent review, where he shows you weight loss and loss of muscle strength don't go together. When you gain weight, your muscle mass goes up a little bit, but your muscle strength doesn't change. So really, we should be looking at muscle strength. And again, this is showing outcomes with dinopenia versus sarcopenia. Clearly, dinopenia wins in every single specific. There are many different ways to measure each of these, and I don't think it really matters which ones you want to choose. We're going to focus somewhat on these as being associated with the sarcopenia definition. Uh, the frailty definitions, I think, work very well. The one that we particularly like is the one from Bruno Bellis' group, the INA group, which is short. It's five, uh, sub, uh, five words, uh, which you can do in 15 seconds in the clinic, and it works as well as any of these. And there was now data from three groups suggesting it works as well as any of the more complex ones that are out there. And then disability, multiple different ways you can measure. So, how do we measure? We told you there were many things. I think ultrasound has been underlooked after Dr. Narici is going to be talking about that later in the meeting. I think it is something that is relatively easy to do and tells you something about tendons, which I think is very important. This is Fred Wu's paper with uh, testosterone along with Narici. And then we have to worry about nerves and are we going to need to measure and use electrical impedance biography to recognize that somebody whose nerves are not working is something that fixes the muscle and they may not work. We need muscle biomarkers and there are actually in the literature a lot of potential biomarkers that exist.
consensus. They are very well correlated with speed and older people, uh, with factory mass, uh, with mass again. Uh, and if you correct and use statin rather than creatinine, this is a very good marker when you take the two together, creatinine over statin to correct for renal failure. Uh, and the N-terminal propeptide 3 was increased with testosterone. So we have some intermediate markers if you are desperate for them, but don't necessarily have to be. So what did we show at the meeting? Stephen described the people who were there, and we came up with the term sarcopenia with limited mobility. The feeling in the end was that sarcopenia should be kept as it was. One of the real reasons to do this is when we tried to change the term cachexia to wasting disease, at a previous consensus meeting, every European told us we can't do that. And they got really upset about using a term that has already been set in the literature as one term and turning it to another. They may have had other reasons, but that's where it is. Now the Europeans think that they can take a term that's set in the literature and change it to mean anything. So, you know, uh, this always worries me when people change their mind about things. I really believe we should be a little careful, careful about how we define things. So, the consensus was sarcopenia with limited mobility, a specific condition with clear loss of muscle mass and a clear target for intervention. It's a syndrome, not a disease. The definition is based on consensus and it differs from the more general concept of Here's the definition. This is published in JAMDA, the General American Medical Directors Association, so you can get the full paper if you like. A person with muscle loss whose walking speed is equal to or less than one meter per second, or who walks less than 300 meters during a six minute walk. The person should also have a lean abdominal mass corrected for height squared of more than two standard deviations below that of healthy persons between 20 to 30 years of age of the same ethnic group. We don't even possess much of this data to be able to do this at the moment. Sarcopenia is generally believed to be age associated and its prevalence increases with age. That was the definition we finished up with. We had some clear exclusions. Peripheral vascular disease with intermittent fornication, and I'll show you an example of why that was right in a minute. Dispo uh, diagnosable congenital or acquired muscle diseases, things like myotonia dystrophica and inclusion body myositis. This is an orphan disease that deserves much more thought by the people who are involved in developing uh, muscle treatments because it is a true disease of middle-aged people with muscle problems, most probably fixable, it's an inflammatory disorder, should be having much more attention paid to it. But it is not sarcopenia and it is not cachexic, so it is a clear example of something that is neither of those two. Central nervous system disorders, stroke, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, are clearly different. Peripheral nervous system disorders, for example, motor neuron disease, spinal cord disease, or peripheral neuropathy. There was a need to exclude cachexia, and many people wanted to exclude dementia, though many demented patients can be sarcopenic as well. This is the fast troponin activator that's uh, increased. And if you just look here, this is the cytokinetics one. What they show, which is interesting, is they could increase muscle strength with their drug. But in people with peripheral vascular disease, they decrease six-minute walk distance and increase dizziness. So you can increase strength in a peripheral vascular disease person and have a worse outcome. Something I've expected a long time. It's not surprising, but we need to recognize that. So there were clear outcomes created for the sarcopenia with limited mobility to allow clinical trials. An increase of the six-minute walk of 50 meters or an increase of gait speed of 0.1 meters per second. Notice the 50-minute meter, meter criteria was used for approval by the FDA of drug, both for peripheral vascular disease and pulmonary hypertension. This is the reason to look for this, and uh, pulmonary hypertension I think is 35 meters, but realistically this is already FDA approved for two different conditions. So it makes sense to focus on this if you are looking for an approval criteria that is relatively easy to get to. Who should be screened? Basically, all persons over 60 years of age before felt, uh, uh, felt their, walk, uh, their walking speed has decreased, had a recent hospitalization, have prolonged bed rest, have problems rising from a chair, and need to use an assistive device while walking. This means that to make this work in the United States, you need to reimburse this. separately physicians 
geriatricians, generalists, uh, for the six minute walk test during their visit. And we're basically suggesting you start with limited mobility and you move from there. Uh, Ted Maelstrom will produce, uh, present the data from our group, which clearly shows limited mobility is a tremendous predictor of poor outcomes in a late middle age population. On the other hand, sarcopenia makes up a very small part of that. So when you find limited mobility, then you have to decide who is sarcopenic and should be treated versus who has other things, arthritis being a big one in that. So, sarcopenia with limited mobility, it's believed this definition clearly defines a syndrome whose treatment should delay the onset of disability and as such provides a clearly defined entity which can be subjected to therapeutic intervention and for which there is an acceptable defined response which should allow the development of pharmaceutical products that can be approved by regulatory agencies. Now this may be a little bit of hope, but I think it's close to real. This is a comparison of the four different definitions out there, and here's sarcopenia with limited uh, uh, mobility. The others, which sometimes call it sarcopenia, sometimes call it something else, basically, the, uh, if you look here, the gain speed is in all of them, the six-minute walk is not in all of them, the cachexia and anorexia group had other physical performance measures as being okay. All of these were the screen. So you screen with the function and then proved it was due to sarcopenia by measuring muscle mass. And this is a very reasonable uh, uh, way to look at it. should point out to you that the European Boat Group did not define low muscle mass. So, you know, that's your guess, okay? So just like to do that to get that. If talking to the audience, I'm doing that specifically for you, Tommy. Otherwise, it's fine. Uh, but we're teasing a little bit about this. But you have to define what you're going to be. Whether it's two standard deviations or something else, we can argue. I think looking at our data and others, two standard deviations is a reasonable starting point when we want to look at this. Stefan brought up myopenia. We need to point out that myopenia most probably is a reasonable way to look at this because there are a lot of congenital muscular disorders and you can't call those sarcopenia. And then there are a lot of acquired things that we've got rid of arguing whether sarcopenia is also cachexia. And obviously I feel fairly strongly that sarcopenia is not cachexia, but I'm a geriatrician. And uh, it really makes me tremble when I see Vicky get up and talk about sarcopenia and cancer. That's cachexia. I mean, I can recognize that and I'm just a poor geriatrician, you know. So we have to stop doing some silly things that just confuse the literature. I think wherever you are, <laughs> giving you a bad time. I love you. Uh, hypothyroidism. No one can tell me hypothyroidism is either sarcopenia or basically cachexia. We pointed out peripheral vascular disease, totally different disease, which is cause muscle wasting. Inclusion body myositis, certainly a different disease. Now, to finish up, what I want to point out to you is we now, or in January, will have a gold standard for drugs. Maria Fianaroni Singh and her husband, uh, Naylor Singh, are publishing in the JAMA a approach to basically hip fracture, where they took people with hip fracture and one group got regular treatment, the other group got added to this for a year, resistance training twice a week. They showed decreased mortality, decreased hospitalization, decreased nursing time, improved activities of daily living, and improved walking without an assistive device. So in a year, with a not large number, this was not a huge number, they showed that you could get all those things that were suggested by the FDA non-receptive representative, but these are things you can't get. So to bring a drug out that says, well, I can make you walk two yards longer, when we know that resistance exercise will do better, it's not going to work. I should point out that uh, Ian Chapman, also in Australia, used testosterone plus protein to go, or a caloric protein supplement together, and showed that you could decrease hospitalization. So I think we have a gold standard now in the sarcopenic area or in the rehab area where you can actually make a difference. We know within a year you can treat people short term and you can make the real outcome differences starting with mortality. So I think that's where we have to go. And I know many of the industry people are now going to shiver because you've got to be at least as good as resistant exercise. And that's a hard bar to get over. But you know, if you buy a trainer for somebody, they're better most probably than most of the drugs we're going to have. And I've got 27 seconds left, and so I just want to show you Francis Bessels at 84.
She's not very magnificent here, Mr. Donaldson, until you realize that's an artificial shoulder. She's got two artificial knees and one artificial hip. Otherwise, yeah, so what? So if you do resistance exercise, you do very well and you can still do things other people can't do. Thank you very much. Thank you. 